a while back. It certainly wasn't complete, so it's a little bit rough and ready. But hey, who cares? Let's get going. So this is all about um, the many and very different ways that you can create a Kubernetes cluster um, to begin experimenting on. Kubernetes um, ha has got, as you would imagine, it's got quite a lot of moving parts um, under the hood. Um, if you go with a hosted version, obviously, with one of the cloud providers, your AWS, your Googles, your uh, Microsofts, <clears throat> then a, a lot of that complexity is managed by, by them. But obviously, you do have to pay for it. Um, so this is going to show you uh, a little cheeky but not pretentious, pretentious way that you're able to spin up your own uh, Kubernetes cluster running on AWS. Uh, by using uh, Terraform. OK. Um, we don't have any questions as of yet. So that's all very well and good. Let's seamlessly move on to the next slide. Awesome. You should be seeing the next slide. If you're not, somebody can shout. OK, what, what is Kubernetes? I'm sure that everybody's pretty well aware of what, of what the situation is with Kubernetes itself. From an architectural perspective, uh, there's two two sort of main components in there, I suppose, at a very high level. Uh, there's what's known as the Kubernetes control plane, and there's the Kubernetes workers. So if you think of the Kubernetes control plane uh, as like the mothership, and the actual Kubernetes workers are, in this particular case, an EC2 instances running uh, Docker. So the control plane will make sure that all of the um, the Kubernetes workers uh, are all managed uh, and that the jobs are all put out. It'll look after all of the um, IP addressing for you, the port forwarding, all the rest of that stuff. So there's two, two different ways that you can spend some money on Kubernetes, like as far as going hosted goes. Uh, obviously, since um, a a AWS or whoever the cloud provider are, are managing and obscuring all that uh, complexity behind the control plane, uh, you generally have to pay a per, a per hour uh, fee for that. So I know with um, Amazon, your mileage may vary with you know with the other guys. Um, I think they recently reduced their cost from 20 cents an hour to 10 cents an hour uh, or something like that. So that's that's lots of fun. And obviously, if you're spinning up the Kubernetes workers, so the actual beasts that are doing all the grunt work, uh, then you're paying for um, EC2 resource on that. It's exactly the same. So you pay for, for the compute that you consume. Okay, so control plane is charged by the hour, just like the worker instances. Let's move on. Okay, so you can, you can create a Kubernetes cluster on your local LAPI if you wanted to. Um, there are some reasonably simplistic ways of doing this, uh, including if you've got Docker Desktop, you know, for example, um, somebody's saying that they cannot hear the speaker. Uh, is everybody able to hear me now? I'm getting it suggested that I may not be hearable. Can somebody go on chat? Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, I'm sorry for whoever can't hear me. Turn up your hearing aids. Okay, Docker Desktop. Okay, so Docker Desktop, you've probably got it running on your uh, on your laptop just now. Uh, if you have a look at Docker Desktop, there's a little drop down, the little icon, which says Enable Kubernetes Cluster. It's, it, it's as simple as that. The first time that you enable the Kubernetes Cluster, it needs to pull down a whole bunch of uh, Docker containers. Um, the second time you boot it, when Docker comes up, Kubernetes com you know, uh, comes up as well. If you're using Docker Stack, um, it will natively deploy onto Kubernetes as well. It's probably the easiest entry point that's not going to cost you anything. Okay, somebody oh, said they couldn't hear me. I also had a big, beautiful oh, oh. That's very interesting that somebody's getting more than that. Maybe they're, they know more about Kubernetes than I do. It wouldn't yeah. surprise me. I'm just going to mute everybody for a second. There we go. Okay. So we can go, uh, you can use things like Docker Desktop. It's really easy. Minikube is another way traditionally being able to spin up the stuff. There's even vagrant recipes out there as well, which will create the control plane and it'll, it'll 
um, give you a couple of workers as well. An easier way of doing it, especially if you've got somebody else's credit card, uh, you can use uh, hosted offerings. Obviously, that's going to that's going to make it a little bit easier to create the cluster. But the way that you actually access the services that are running on the cluster is is a bit more obscure if you're running it on somebody else's machine. We'll come to that. Okay, so local install. That sounds like I'm repeating myself. Fantastic. So Terraform, if, if you've not if you've not used it, um, I'm just trying to remember why I put this particular slide in here. Anyway, fabulously interesting. The the latest version of Terraform is is a major release update. So if you do have to use Terraform to be able to uh, provision all of your um, EKS cluster, um, there, there may be some of the Terraform um, manifests or whatever you want to call them that may be in an older version of Terraform. So I'm just giving you that bit of information uh, so you can learn how to update the syntax as is required. Anyway, uh, hopefully you won't have to do that. Okay, so EKS from a not from a non-production perspective, uh, obviously there there's there's a heck of a lot of stuff that you can do to bolt down uh, Kubernetes. There's a lot of different companies that are helping uh, that that can help you with that. Uh, coming along to De DevSecOps is in Sydney is generally a pretty good little place to learn how to do that. Now that we've got the streaming platform, we may be able to provide. Uh, some Kubernetes uh, securing um, a little bit more consumable via webinar. Okay, so if you just Google Terraform AWS EKS, um, the particular link, uh, this the link down to Terraform AWS EKS is the very first one that you'll see up at the top of the pile. Uh, so that that's the code that you're going to need. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Okay, no other comments coming in. That's good. Um, so what we're going to do, what, once we have cloned that software, uh, we're going to uh, CD into the Terraform AWS CKS examples basic directory. <coughs> this makes it very, very simple. All we need to do is just um, update the variables.tf file. Um, I, I added... Let me show you. Um, where? Okay, so when you're sharing your screen and you've got three monitors, it's always a bit of a let's have a dig on through and see. I can't find my terminal. Anyway. I'm going to come back to that. So, Stephen, there's a bit of a uh, flatten versus calico discussion in the chat. Are you able to just give a little bit of color to the differences and why you'd use one over the other? If not, and why um, you use one? Angus, feel free to give your opinions in the chat, right? Yep. What I might do is just ca carry on with uh, with the Prezo. Anybody's got any questions? Obviously, you, you can file them up uh, in chat. Okay, so if I was to take my little terminal window, I'm going to make one one more try of, of sharing my sharing my screen here. I saw lots of screens. I just didn't see my terminal window. <laughs> oh, there we go. Come on, screen share. Clear this permission to ask again. Okay, there we go. Hey, I found my terminal. Awesome. Let me see. Wow, that's quite a small window. Is there any danger that you can read that? If you can pop a little pop a little note in chat, please. Can anybody read the writing on the screen? I might just embiggen it a bit. Anybody else? Chat, can you let me know if you can read what's on the screen? All good. Awesome. So I've changed the directory uh, into the basic example. 
if we have a look at variables.tf, well done as I've just updated the default to be an AP Southeast 2 for our particular region. Um, and also, um, I update in the main.tf file. I've got this in the, in the notes, which I will share after this talk as well. Uh, in here, the cluster name, oh, um, all I've done is I've just pre-pended pre something that makes sense to me. So in KTS rocks dash EKS. Okay, so I'm just trying to see if there's any questions. I'm hoping that everybody has been able to see that. Uh, and that, that was basically all of the configuration that was required. Okay, so I'll stop my screen share, put back over here again. Okay. So as it said, I updated a bit variables.tf. Um, I also prepended the name of my cluster, so it makes a little bit a little bit more sense. And I did a Terraform in it. Uh, obviously, you need to download and install ter Terraform from uh, the wonderful HashiCops uh, websites. Um, Terraform init will pull down the the modules that are required for the Terraform AWS EKS code to work. So there's a couple of modules, including the AWS one, that needs to come down. So that Terraform init might it might take whatever 30 seconds, 45 seconds, all, only once. Uh, then we're doing our, our Terraform plan, uh, outputting that plan into uh, a file that we can then apply um, in the next command there, as you can see. Okay, so moving on. What we do at the end of that is we end up with a control plane that is configured. So by that, I mean that if I visit um, Amazon's console, I can have a quick look at um, I can have a quick look at the um, EKS section, and it's it's going to show me that there's a cluster there. And you can also see here we've got um, an uh, auto scaling group of workers as well. So as the, um, as the demand grows, maybe you are sort of expanding the number of the amount of capacity that you need. You know your replication sets, as they talk about in Kubernetes then you can, you can create um, auto scaling groups to, for the workers to be able to accommodate for that growth and also reduction again, which is cool. Uh, we can override any of the compute that is specified in, the, um, in that code, which means that we can specify, if we're just playing around here, we can even specify like a, maybe something as low as like a T2 micro uh, for your workers, which means it's going to keep your costs down to either near, you know nearly free um, in effect. Okay, um, so then we start to do a little bit of a test. So this obviously assumes that you've got the um, AWS CLI already installed. So if we can do AWS EKS list clusters, that is going to use the .AWS Credentials, if you spell it as I've got it on the screen, you may have a few issues. Okay, so AWS EKS list clusters. Let me just see if I can pull that up on my screen. Where are we? There we go. So that was AWS, oops, aux, uh, AWS uh, EKS list clusters. There we go. Okay, so here, here's one I prepared earlier. So this... I'm going to share your screen. Uh, sharing it is always better, right? There we go. I do apologize. I thought I was sharing already. AWS EKS. Got it. Thank you. Clusters. And that is on to AWS, and it shows me what I've got configured, including uh, the the name that I pre in the main.tf file. This is a bit different. It's one that I, I prepared a little so it shows that at an AWS level, we've got the 
we have the permissions, the roles, and all the rest of that stuff configured correctly to be able to show us what clusters are running um, on the EKS control plane. OK, so what's the next step? Let's find out, kids. Here we go. So we proved it at AWS level. We've got the um, authorization and authentication bits are looking as if they might be working. OK, so I have a cluster. How am I going to use it? So you've got a cluster in um, AWS. How, how do you actually connect onto it? Um, well, you need to uh, install a little tool called Kube Control. C uh, Kube CTL um, is one of the more popular ones. I'm not sure if there's any others to tell the truth. Uh, it's a Go binary, so it's all completely self-contained. Uh, download that. It's got the link on the page for you there. Um, so what, what happens when you run that Terraform code is it spits out all of the authentication details and the certificate details, I should say, that Kube Control is going to need. Now, all that, all that um, security information, authentication information is held in your, um, it could be held in any file, but typically it's under your home directory .cube directory. Um, and the file is called config. So if I was just to pull up um, my share screen for a second, and this time I'll actually share it, which is even better. There we go. So we can see uh, that there's a out.tf. What's the name of that file again? There we go. Okay. So if, um, there is a file called Cube Control, where oops, Cube Control that gets created as a result of running this. And what this does, what this file contains, is all Stephen, of the. Stephen, you started a Cube Cuddle versus Cube Control war. Oh, sorry. Say again, Scott. You've started the oh. uh, nameless Cube Cuddle versus Kube Control War. There's two ways to say it. You're either Kube Cuddle or you're Kube Control. And uh, right. that's writing words. Or Kube Config you're talking about. Yeah, so this is Kube, Kube CTL that I'm talking about, which reads the home directory dot Kube Control file. In this Kube Control, it's got all of the security information, the certificate stuff that is required to allow Kube Control to be able to authenticate and do stuff. OK, so all, all that information uh, um, is accessible via the Terraform uh, output as well. So there's all sort of stuff in there, security certificates, blah, blah, blah. So to make it easy, like if you're just starting with uh, Kubernetes, what you can do is just take that Kube Control file and copy over the top. I'm trying to uh, make this as readable as possible. It may not be, so I'll go to cube. Oops. It's wrapping off the off the edge of the screen. I'll pull it just in one second. So there's dot cube config. So I'm not sure if we can see that. I'll try and pull the screen in just a little bit. There we go. So it wraps it. So just copy the cube, cube control file, uh, sorry, cube config file over the top of your own cube dot cube slash config. So then what we do is we need to do some tests. Okay. So if I recall correctly, what the next slide wrote is cube control. In fact, I'm going to show you the next slide before I execute this command. There's a reason for it. Okay, so down the bottom of this slide, you can see I've copied the cube control file into my home directory dot cube directory slash config. Now we'll go to test. We know it works at Amazon credentials level, but will cube control be able to work now as well? So here's a little test. We can do cube control space cluster dash info. So I just know that you're going to get this error message most likely. Um, unable to connect to the server, get credentials, blah, 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 blah. So what 
uh, kubectl uses by default is the AWS IAM Authenticator. So this is, uh, what this does is it, as far as I know, it generates temporary um, STS tokens. I'm sure that I'm gonna get absolutely uh, corrected as appropriate by Gus as required. Uh, so we need to have um, STS tokens to allow kubectl to be able to authenticate and do what it, what it needs to do. So kubectl runs the AWS IAM Authenticator, which you need to download as a single binary, make sure it's in your path. Uh, hopefully it will then, it will run the AWS IAM Authenticator. It'll get its uh, temporary um, STS tokens. And then hopefully kubectl will then work. Okay, so if I just move on to the next slide, kubectl cluster info. Okay, so if I whip back onto my screen share for a second, and go to there. Oh, can't remember that decision. That's okay. I would do Q control space cluster info. Sorry, Scott. No can see screen. No can see screen. A bit upset. Uh, just as well, actually, this Q control is not working. <laughs> Is that me preventing people from seeing the goodness? Is anybody yeah, beautiful? You're, you're, you're not so bad yourself, Scott. Um, okay, so if I do the key control cluster info, um, it's it's connecting all to um, out, or it's authenticating using that authenticator uh, that I mentioned before, uh, which is the temporary SES token, which you don't need to. Um, and it's showing me that the Kubernetes master, which is the control plane, the API, running at that particular address, and there's a bit of some DNS stuff happening as well, which you don't know about. So this is success. Uh, we, we have all the authentication authorization stuff is working to allow uh, Kube control to be able to see that the cluster is actually running. So this is one jubilant point. If you get you get to the bit, you've done well so far. Okay, so uh, let's just have a look at the the slides. Okay, so now we can do some stuff for the cluster. So let's give it a try. Here's a little um, deployment job, uh, which will run. I think it's a, a couple of nginx servers. In fact, you, you can see it here. Um, it says it's doing an nginx deployment. Uh, it talks about the actual container down the bottom. The container name is um, nginx. The image it's going to pull down, so the Docker image. What ports it's going to expose within Kubernetes itself, uh, and it shows you down the bottom of the screen how to apply it. Okay, so if I was to whip back onto my screen, I can't. Oh, there we go. Uh, let me just see. I'm just sneaking onto another screen so I can copy and paste that line. It's not quite so easy copy and pasting from PDFs. Have the presentation rather than your terminal, Stephen. Yeah, and I'm feeling bad about that. So here's here's the share. People can see my terminal window again. So all, all I've done is I have co copied and pasted that line. So we know that kube control is working. It's authenticating. It's authorized to be able to do some stuff. <clears throat> so it's now speaking to um, EKS. And it's parsing that simple little YAML file. It's taking its sweet time, which it doesn't normally do. <laughs> Says him. Right, come on. Chop, 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 chop. Right. Maybe get Scott just to sing you a quick song in the meantime. Live demo gods, you got to love them. Come on. Paul, on where everyone has their Kubernetes installation installed. So if everyone can have a bit of a, a crack and answer that, that would be fantastic. 
Super no option for all of the above. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay, so it's come back. I said that deployment dot apps nginx deployment created, uh, which is cool. So I can do like um, cube control get get pods, for example. I don't know why it took other than I've got a really, 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 really old web connection here. There we go. Already, it has created two um, Nginx servers part of that deployment. And it's probably, it'll have created the service associated with them as well, such that it can actually be exposed to the outside world. There we go. Mind. Uh, I don't know whether it should have created a service. I probably should have checked if I was doing a talk, you know, and wanted to prepare. It's okay. Right. Uh, so that's so that's if anyone is able to uh, give Stephen a pointer, just yell out in the chat. That's fine. Yeah. So cube control. We've done that. Apply if we want to get rid of those uh, those pods. So think about if you're not overly familiar with Kubernetes, think about pods as sort of kind of like containers. It, it, it's not like that, but you can. It's quite easy to start thinking like that and, and to get the hang of it. So I've created a couple of let's call them containers uh, with um, Nginx running on them, and now I'm just running kube control delete from that particular file, and it's delete all features that were required to be able to do that, including uh, you know, deleting the service, delete the pods, delete the delete any yeah uh, Okay, so it's all gone. So now I do uh, get pods again. There we go, it's gone. So you might think that actually prevented you from running. <laughs> of course it does, because the actual Kubernetes workers are still running. So, you know, the clock is still running on that one. Okay, so that has, that's worked sort of, kind of, as it should have, I think, which is awesome. And then we've got the little command there just to check the actual deployment in isolation. If I just wanted to see uh, what was happening with that um, Nginx deployment job, then that's the command that I would have used. Okay, so that's sort of, I think, okay. With regards to build, building a local cluster, you can figure that out yourself. This is where my my time started to run out when I had about an hour to prepare this talk um, earlier on today. So you can have a little play with Docker Desktop yourself. Uh, it's really pretty easy. And I was going to suggest um, how for talks, please do put your put your thoughts into the chats into the chat window here. This is just a couple of ideas uh, that I was going to run past you for ne next uh, next session. Uh, if people have got lot, lots of Docker files, uh, how, how do you actually migrate them to Kubernetes? You know that that might be interesting. You know how do you maybe you've got some you know Docker Compose files? Uh, how how do you migrate them into you know Kubernetes syntax? Um, so I mentioned. When you run Kubernetes with uh, hosted, uh, with you know, with one of the we have the, a, a question about uh, egress controller as well in the next session. Egress controller, there is interest. I was just about to give the egress, background on egress. what. Oh. Yeah. So when when you deploy Docker on your local laptop, everything's awesome. You can just go to localhost one two seven dot zero zero one. <laughs> nearly forgot that one. On a specific port, and that and that is your Docker, sorry, your Kubernetes um, interface for your local machine. <clears throat> so if you were to run up an, an nginx server, exact, you know, for example, an nginx uh, deployment, and expose it out on port eighty, you can just go to open up browser one two seven zero zero one on port eighty, and maybe this is a bad example. You put on eighty one. Uh, so you go to one two seven zero zero one on port eighty one. You're gonna you're gonna see your web server, okay? But what happens if you run up an EKS cluster, for example? How do you expose 
those services. And that's where uh, reverse proxy uh, or something that's a little bit more sort of specialized in the Kubernetes field, they talk about um, ingress controllers. So there's products like um, traffic uh, for playing in non-prod uh, is, the, is the advice that I have heard. Um, Nginx is reasonably, uh, in fact, I think I'm contractually bound to say it's bulletproof, haven't I, Scott? <laughs> it's an open source project. You can say whatever you like about it, man. Yeah, it is. Even, even though Scott is actually pretty closely affiliated, it's a, it's a super product and you should have a look at it. Anyway, um, so those of you who are interested in learning how to convert like Docker files or Docker Compose files into Kubernetes, you can put it up on the chat. And be interested in learning about um, ingress controllers. How do you deploy um, a cluster of web servers or like a, a LAMP stack, hypothetically, or something, something like that? How do you deploy it? And then how do you expose it to the outside world? Uh, so if you can put your put your feelings in the chat window on that one. Lots of people are using traffic in production. I take it back. Maybe traffic is an absolutely awesome thing. It did seem to be very simple. Um, my inexperienced ear was talking to somebody uh, who knows a little bit about it, and they were saying, "If you've got That's an opportunity." Really interesting, Stephen. Um, yep. The two sort of ingress controls that I'm seeing a lot of at the moment are traffic and um, I mean, I'll, I'll say traffic, right? Because it's really because of the simplicity, um, people are really loving being able to use it, right? So, and I'm going to talk with Vincent Rullier as someone who can probably do a talk about that. Right, OK. So who's um, anybody out there using using tra traffic, uh, hypothetically speaking, in production? Maybe unmute, unmute the entire group for a bit of a discussion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's see how we go with that. How hard can it be, eh? Have a couple, a couple of hundred people all talking at the same time. Let's see what happens. I'm um, just trying to come on, drop, drop. There we go. Unmute all. Okay, you're unmuted. This is very, very scary. Speaker two and the MC do appear to be muted. Maybe not. Okay, yeah. So, is um, anybody actually using tra um, traffic in production at all? Yes, uh, Rajesh. Yeah. Hey, oh, Rajesh. Hey. Um, yes, uh, we've been using traffic for production. So basically, what we use is uh, so first of all, we're managing Kubernetes on-prem. As a result of that, uh, the whole of the network policies, which is the ingress and egress rules, which are um, pre-built policies that needs to be defined. Uh, as part of the capabilities. So it's all being integrated as part of the network policy. So you have a network policy for ingress, where it says is like, what are the inbound ports and where is it coming from? Where's the origin and where is the destination is getting into and what ports it's allowed. And the same goes is like, what ports, uh, what are the, uh, what is the network IPs which goes out of the port and what trading on, whether it's uh, uh, HTTP or HTTPS. If it is HTTPS, then you need to have TLS based security encrypted. So you need to, you need to yep. have a reference to a TLS. Then the TLS also you can basically incorporate and bind it as a secret, so that you just need to refer a secret as the reference as opposed to the TLS as a chunk. Uh, uh, so all this goes as part of that. Yes, uh, ingress is nothing but any traffic which is coming inside the network, Kubernetes cluster, all the way to the port. Uh, that involves your ingress controllers, which are engine engineers ingress controllers. Then as Stephen talked about um, uh, services, uh, uh, sorry, ingress definition, then ingress definition comes bind to a service and from a service map to uh, a pod uh, and service also has got an associated endpoint under the covers. Like if you say kubectl uh, get endpoints, get SVC, um, you see a service there. And also if you say kubectl get endpoints, you see an endpoint which is associated with the service, which is which, which is where behind the scene, the net how Kubernetes operate, which you don't really see it. We don't give much importance to the endpoints. But endpoints really, when poor, you're sending a poor network traffic which is outside, for instance, uh, let's say I have to connect to a box, 
right? So I have, uh, for example, from my, uh, like from my microservice, I'm originating a request to a box. The box is basically a network which sits outside. Uh, so if your, if your organization only allows certain destinations to go out, that's where endpoints comes to the picture, which you have to clearly define it in your, in the, uh, sorry, in your uh, network policy as an egress road. So egress is any traffic going out on a port, on an endpoint, and on a range. Uh, so you have to re uh, uh, you, or you have to define at the IP side uh, range level and say, okay, it's what a 32-bit addressing. Uh, uh, if so, how many ports I should allow? How many IP ranges I should allow to go out so that it opens a wider traffic so that uh, the egress rule is defined as wider. And some organizations, they go very tighter at saying, okay, this is the only port and IP. That's what Okay, I've got, um, th thank you, Rajesh. I've got an urgent poll for you, Scott, please. If you could just poll people to find out if um, Rajesh is or is not one of our next speakers to talk about uh, setting up Ingress stuff. <laughs> hey, we're doing this democratically. That's all I can yeah. say. So I've done like uh, <laughs> probably like a year and a half of this, uh, especially for the, like Stephen, you know, that we've done for the, Stephen also visited once uh, for that thing, how we've been set up. Um, yeah, it's, that's what it is. Like the majority of a lot of security base under the covers, very tight under security where you won't even have access to the outside world. So you're operating on a Kubernetes cluster where there is no access to the Docker hub, or no access to the outside world. So how do you successfully operate on that? Love those. those are the things. Yeah. Love those. I've worked in TS environments where you've got air gaps and stuff like that. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yep. Awesome. All right.